as you get into the word of the Lord down in the student building. While they're finding their place down below the hill and while you're finding your place in a seat tonight, I also want you to find your place back in Ephesians chapter 4. Really just going to skim the surface tonight. I know last week in our series we got a little carried away on marriage, amen, and it happened to fit the context, but it was beautiful because we had so many people in-house and online say, my goodness, that little little caveat rabbit trail helped our home, amen, and so the Lord doeth all things well. The, the Bible will hit you right where you're at. It'll meet every need that you have. I tell people what God orders, he pays for. So last week, he ordered up a little bit of a message on marriage, and he paid for it, amen, and he gave us something out of the meat of his word that we desperately needed. And uh, I'll save more of the marital teaching till the next chapter because it's about to get thick and rich, amen, in chapter 5. And so we'll stay there for several weeks, I'm sure, probably a month or so, but we'll get there when the Lord says. But go to Ephesians chapter 4. We've prayed a lot tonight, so I'm just going to jump right into the immediate context. I want to go back to verse number 25 and just reiterate, if I can, just for communication purposes, so we're on the same page, the two verses that we talked about, uh, some at length and some not so much, because we did get carried away in verse 26, which it was a Holy Spirit carrying away. But he says in verse 25, wherefore, the word wherefore is referring to the fact that because we've been saved and we crucified the old man, we put on the new man, because when you get saved, the gospel brings about not behavior modification, it brings about heart transformation, right? Behavior modification is heretical in the church world. Just change your behavior. No, no, no. You don't change your behavior. You get saved and he changes your heart, which changes your behavior. Okay, it's a gospel transformation. We've said that often. So he says, because of that, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Why? For we are members one of another. And we talked about the fact that the reason many times, whether it be marriage, whether it be family, or whether it be in this context, a local church setting, a local church family, lying causes disharmony, disruption, and disunity to the body. So when we're honest and open and, dare I say, vulnerable with each other, it brings about unity in the body of Christ. So we are not to lie to each other. We're to be the most truthful people on the planet. Can I get a witness? Amen. Then he says in verse 26, be ye angry. You see, there is a righteous indignation that we can biblically display. It's okay to be angry at sin, to be angry at a wicked, demonized, hostile, corrupt culture. It's okay to be angry when they butcher babies. It's okay to be angry when they target our children. It's okay to be angry when we see all of our freedoms and liberties slipping away. But in the anger, don't sin. Get righteously mad about it, but righteously do something about it because the problem with the American church is far too often we complain about the dark and never shine our light. We're just mad about stuff. Do something. Harness the anger in a righteous way. Harness the anger in a righteous way. So be angry and sin not. And then here's where we got on to the, the marital part. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So I know I'm not supposed to go to bed mad or angry in any situation, but think about the context of marriage. What happens if you go to bed angry at your spouse? You wake up more angry at your spouse, and you end up arguing about nonsensical, foolish, incidental things that God don't even care about. You ever notice that the biggest arguments you've ever had were stupid? They just were. So don't go to bed angry. And again, we talk much about the idea of what we have here is a failure to communicate. We have to learn to look each other in the eyes and communicate the hard stuff. Marriage is about having someone that can help you unravel the hard stuff. Right? They should be, your husband, your wife, should be your number one confidant in life. You should, as embarrassing as it is at times, you should be willing to bear anything to them. Which, by the way, the, I suppose, I don't want to use the strong word of curse, but I guess the downside of that is because they do know you better than anybody. Have you ever noticed that you can pray with and for everyone and it never bothers you? 
But to pray out loud with your spouse is the most difficult person you'll hold hands and pray with. Why? Because you can't fake it till you make it. You can't speak King James English to God in front of him or her because they know you. Right? And so I can pray for everybody on the planet and see marvelous, miraculous results. But the most difficult person to pray with is my wife. Not because she's my wife, but because she knows everything about me because she is my wife. And you can't just put on a Jimmy Carter smile and fake it till you make it. So make sure that your communication with your spouse, husband and wife, is legit and on par. And make sure no matter how mad you are, you don't go to bed angry. It was beautiful to have people in this church come to me in the context of the next couple of days and said, Hey, I was up till 2 or 3 in the morning, but we got it right. Huh? Don't go to sleep mad. Don't go to sleep angry. That's the most practical thing I'll say. Now, you'll notice when he says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, there is not a period there, which means the thought is a continual thought into the next verse. So he says, neither give place to the devil, period, which means what he just said in the previous verses is something that if we do not obey it, it will be an open door to the devil. Somebody says, well, if I can give place to the devil, what place does he take? The place you give him. Anything the devil has in your life, you gave it to him because you have to open a door to the demonic. And often it's unforgiveness and anger that is the portal that opens that door and gets you to a place where you are afflicted, tormented, oppressed, and demonized by a spirit of anger and wrath and bitterness, which will in turn ruin every relationship, especially in the context of your marriage. So he says, don't give place to the devil. The word place is interesting. It means single occupancy. You know what the devil's number one job is? To scooch, if I might use the word theologically, scooch Jesus off the throne of your life. Because the throne of your life and the throne of your heart is designed singly for one person. And so the devil wants to divorce you from the lordship of Jesus and take ownership of an area of your life that should be in full submission to Jesus Christ. That's what the devil wants to do. And so he says right here, don't you give place to the devil. Don't give in to him. Don't open the door. Don't give him a portal. Don't give him a foothold. Okay, do not give him the opportunity to make a fool out of you because he will do it 100 times out of 100. Neither give place to the devil. Now, context of the Bible is important because when you see a verse like neither give place to the devil, it is not what we call a standalone passage. You can apply it many ways, but you can only interpret it within the immediate setting of its context. And its context is, don't lie or you'll give place to the devil. Don't be wrath-filled, unforgiving, and bitter, or you'll give place to the devil. But what comes next is also giving place to the devil. That's why these verses surround verse 27. Does that make sense? It's like a diamond in a setting, okay? It's more beautiful, it makes more sense, and it's more valuable when you keep it in context, okay? When you keep it in context. Matter of fact, shout context. Remember that word on December the 2nd. You're going to need it. Okay? Neither give place to the devil. Now watch this. Let him that stole. So he's taking into consideration that we've done that. Right? All of us have stolen. You say, I ain't never stolen a thing. Sure you have. Stolen time from your boss when you should be working. You're messing around on Twitter and Facebook, right? You've stolen pencils when you were a kid. All of us try to climb up on the stove and steal the Oreo cookies when grandma wasn't looking. We've all stolen stuff, right? So he said, let him that stole, watch this. Don't make a lifetime habit out of it. Steal no more. So here's what he's saying. When you get saved, stop being a thief. Which, by the way, goes hand in hand with lying. If you are a liar, you are a thief. They are Siamese twins. If you lie about things, you will slip around and steal things. So God said, look, that's your past life. That's what you used to do. Don't open that door to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather, say rather. It means in the stead of, in the place of. Rather let him, I love this, labor working with his hands. Watch this. The thing, the working, which is good. Okay, you get a job. You work hard. Then he says this, why? 
that you can have a whole lot of money in the bank and brag about the car you drive. Nope. You know why God says quit being a thief and start working hard? That he may have to give to him that needeth. That is the polar opposite of the American church mentality. I work hard. It's my money. Nobody has a right to it. Jake breaks. God says, you work hard. He gives you his money so you can bless other people with what you worked for. That's what the Bible says. Now, I know we have to pay bills, but he does not say work hard so you can pay bills. Work hard so you can impress your neighbors. Stop trying to keep up with the Joneses. Here's what the Joneses won't tell you. They are broke and in credit card debt to their eyeballs. Okay? And so he says plainly, why do we work that he may have to give to him that needeth? The number one reason we work to earn God's money is to bless people that have less than we do. That is exactly what the Bible says. And guess what? When you don't do that, how do you give place to the devil? materialism and stinginess because the only remedy to materialism is generosity there is no other remedy for stinginess and materialism other than generosity why are we willing to give sacrificially to him that needeth it doesn't mean that we don't have needs it means we work hard, we meet our needs, but we're willing to use what we have to meet the needs of others. That is an Acts principle. They sold their possessions and goods and gave to every man as they had a need. So we got to get away from this idea that we, we work so we can have better. Mm -mm. We work so others can have better. And you know what happens when you work so others can have better? God will work on your behalf and see that you have better. Because you cannot outgive the Lord. And I'm not talking about just sowing it into an offering plate or into our ministry. No, I'm talking about giving to people on a regular basis with the resources God's entrusted you with. Because when you are a good steward of a little bit, God will see to it that you are a better steward of a lot of it. It's just the way it works. So when you steal, stop stealing. When you work, work for a reason, to bless the people around you. Now watch this, verse 29. I wish every single person that has ever darkened the door of any church would memorize this verse. Let no corrupt communication. That's a broad term. No filthiness, no jesting, no dirty jokes, no cussing, no taking the name of the Lord in vain, no gossip, no slander, no backbiting, which is on par with witchcraft, according to what the Bible says in the book of Galatians, right? So he says, let no, not a, not a bit. Let no corrupt communication proceed, come forth out of your mouth. What does that mean? That means you should think before you speak. Okay, if you're going to, as David said in the book of Psalms, put a watch or a guard over your mouth, it means you have to think about what you're going to say. And the problem often with church people is we speak before we think. Because if you would think before you speak, you would not say what you want to speak. Because nine times out of ten, the first thing you want to say is the last thing you ought to say. Especially in the context of your marriage, can I get a witness? Okay, and so he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Do not let it come out of your mouth. And don't try to spiritually justify it. I get so tired of people saying, well, you know, words are just words. You know, the Bible doesn't condemn certain words. No, it condemns corrupt communication. So if even lost people think it's corrupt, why wouldn't the church think it's corrupt? Well, you know, I can just sit around and watch rated R movies, and they can F-bomb this, and God's name this, and, you know, this, this, that. And, and you know, it just, it just doesn't affect me. That's because you're desensitized by sin and you don't walk in the fear of God. Because I can't sit there and listen to that stuff and just soak it all in and, 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 and not feel weird about it. You say, that's legalism. No, that's holiness. That's not legalism. The Bible says don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. So let me ask you a question. If God don't want you saying it, why does he want you to listen to everybody else saying it? You remember in, in Romans, I, Lord, don't let me get derailed. In Romans 1, the end of the chapter says that 
maybe you don't do those things, comma, but they have pleasure in them that do them. That's the end times. They have pleasure in them that do them. That's the reprobate mind generation. You see, we say, we don't murder. We don't fornicate. We're not adulterers. We're not stabbing people. We're not smoking crack. We're not dropping the F-bomb. Okay, maybe not. But if you have pleasure in them that do it, you're just as guilty. That's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 1. Quote me on that. Don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Okay? That's a good verse for all of us. You know, in a verse like that, I wish all the young people were up here. Hear God. Kids need to clean their mouths up. Church go and save kids. Talk like bar hopping strippers. All this ghetto slang and all this rap music they've been exposed to. And by the way, sometimes it's not the kids that need the whipping. It's the parents that need the whipping for letting them be involved in that nonsense, right? Guttural, grotesque stuff. Don't let that wicked communication come out of your mouth. But, I love this. God's going to butt in here. But, that which is good, well, what makes it good? To the use of edifying. You know, my mouth, according to the book of James has been given to me, and your mouth has been given to you for only two reasons. The glory of God and the good of those around you. So if you use it for something other than God's glory and others building up edification and goodness, then you're using it in a foul way. And the Bible says, can a water spigot, a water fountain, can it bring forth bitter and sweet water at the same time? No, God forbid. It's double-minded. And a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, James 1, 8. Unstable in all of his ways. And so what is it in the context of the book of James that makes people unstable? The way that they use their mouth. Did you know, in every church, I can tell you, in our church and in every church on the planet, the one member of the church that causes the most division. James says, even so our tongue is a little member. The tongue is the most despicable church member on the planet. Stop. And by the way, you think it was bad back then? They didn't have Facebook. You say, well, I'm not like verbally saying it. No, 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 no. You are visibly vomiting it. It's the same thing. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But today, out of the abundance of the heart, the fingers tweet. Out of the abundance of the heart, my Facebook speaks for itself. Right? And so we are to use our words as building blocks of edification. Look, here's a real good rule of thumb. If you hang around somebody and all they ever do is speak negatively, number one, they're disobeying God. And number two, so are you by hanging out with them. Hang around people that build you up and hang around people that build others up. Make sure people use their mouths around you wisely because I'm going to tell you something. If you hang around people that are loose with their lips, give it a few weeks. And you'll be gossiping and slandering about others at a time in your life you would have never done that, but it rubs off on you because evil communication corrupt good manners. So do two things for me as your pastor. Start paying attention to what you say, but start paying attention to what other people say. It'll reveal who they are. It's why if we ever go to a restaurant and you cause trouble for the waitress or the waiter, we will never have another sit-down meal together because you don't know what they're going through. I don't care if they got your steak wrong. I don't care if they gave you a bucket of sweet tea and you begged for unsweet tea, right, which is nothing but dirt water, amen. But nonetheless... You have to recognize the facts that you have to be willing to pay attention to what people are saying to others around you because they're revealing themselves. Let me say this. I'm, 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 I'm going to have to flow back into marriage for a minute, okay? It's just important. It's important. It's important to me. It should be important to all of us. Okay, listen. There have been many times... Uh, Matter of fact, we, we have a gentleman. I'm just going to, I'm not sure if he's, is, is, is Brother Ed here tonight? Is Brother Ed here tonight? I, I think he had the drive late tonight. Ed owns a business in town. 
Ed is a super cool guy. He'll drive me anywhere, anytime. If, if I wanted to drive to Mars and back, right, he'd drive me. He'd figure out a way to get me there, right, regardless if the flat earthers think I could get there or not, right? I'm telling you, it's just, it's just the facts. <laughs> One of the first times I rode with Ed, we were riding back. We had a couple guys in the church and some in the room tonight. And I was sitting in the back, and he was driving me. And I think we went to, like, I don't know, Cincinnati, Timbuktu, somewhere. And we were coming back. And I said, Ed, this is the first time I've ever really got to know you. He just showed up at our church because the Holy Spirit said, showed up and start driving this man of God around, right? And he did. Use his whole business for it. So we was getting ready to pull back into the 2060 here. And I said, Ed, I don't tell you something. I said, I don't even really know you, and I like you. I said, you know why I like you? He said, why? I said, you have a good heart. He said, well, how do you know that? I said, I can tell by the way you talk to your wife on the telephone on a trip. I said, I hear the way you're patient with your wife and joyful when you answer the phone, right? And I said, I can tell a lot about a man by how he responds or the lack of it to his wife on the telephone. Some of you guys, your Adam's apple just got like an Adam's watermelon. It's just the facts. Watch how people speak to others. Let, let me tell you ladies something. Okay, How many, uh, how many single ladies are in the room? How many, how many single ladies? Okay, take note, single man. There's a lot of them in the house. Praise God. Put your hands down. Now, I don't care if you've had a debacle. I don't care if you had a divorce. I don't care what, whatever, you know, but bad prom date, whatever. Okay, here's the facts. Listen to me very closely. If you are dating a man, okay, I'm speaking to women, but from the standpoint of a man that tries to be gracious in every conversation, especially with my wife. That's important. I'm to love her as Christ loved the church. And if you think Jesus, pardon me for sounding irreverent, talks like crap to his church, you need to read a Bible. Okay? Everybody has a bad day. But Jesus don't talk down derogatorily to his bride. He just don't. So listen, if you are dating someone or you want to, pay attention to how he talks to his waitress and waiter in a restaurant If she's alive, pay attention to how he treats his mama. And pay attention to how respectful or disrespectful he is to elderly people. If he disrespects elderly people, if he is a jerk to his mother, I don't mean has a disagreement, is a jerk to his mother. And cannot keep his mouth shut when she doesn't prepare his food and bring it to the table properly. Don't marry him because you in for a hellacious ride. You in for a hellacious ride. Because if he'll talk like that to a girl he don't know bringing food, wait till you burn the biscuits one breakfast. And he done got used to you, Right? He'll be a bull in a china shop. Careful. Everybody has a bad day. But if he consistently has a bad mouth, don't marry him. As a pastor, I beg you, don't marry him until he eats a bar of soap and gets his heart right with Jesus. Okay? That's important. So don't let corrupt communication come out. But that which is good to edify, build up, help people. That it may, what, minister grace. Yeah, there's times we got to rebuke. Yeah, there's times we got to hold people's feet to the fire. We got to hold them accountable. But when we speak, we're to minister grace unto the hearers, no matter who that hearer may be. So it's not always what we say, but rather how we say it. Because you can say, get this, the exact same phrase and words, but it's the tone. Or... The body language with which you use to say it, right? For example, we have a lot of newborn babies in this church, and I love that. 
We have a healthy church, popping out babies, building a nursery on the fly. I love it. Right? I love it. But let's suppose that a visitor, first time, I never met her, her and her husband come up here and they have this baby in this little carriage, roller, bassinet, whatever you call it, right? So they roll this baby up here in this little four-wheel crib. Let's suppose that she pulls back, but she's like, I want you to pray over my baby. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I look down, hey, partner, I look down in the little crib and I say, my, that's a beautiful baby. You know what that mama's going to do? She's going to be like, wow. Whew. Pastor said my baby was beautiful. What if I looked in that crib and I said the exact same words, but I said them like this. My, that's a beautiful baby. <laughs> same words. Different outcome. Right? Because it wasn't what I said that was the problem. It was the way that I said it. He just won't, he don't want me, he wants the microphone. He's a prophet, praise God. He's about to preach. It was the way that I said it, right? So pay attention to how gentle people are with others. That's important. Yes, amen, thank you. Now listen, I, I, I feel like I just need to keep digging down on this for a moment because, you know, when babies crawl up in your arms, it makes you a little more gentle. It, wimp, it wimps you out real quick, right? So listen, there's another thing you need to pay attention to. And I learned this from my grandfather, but not in a righteous way. You know, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, I got a little ring here. The, the Bible says in Proverbs, a righteous man is kind to his beast. You know, I learned a lot of anger from my World War II grandfather. And one of the ways that he would display rage is the way he treated the dogs. He said, I just don't think that's a sign of spirituality. Me neither. It's a sign of the lack of it. Now, I'm not, look, I'm not a cat dude. I'm just not. Okay, number one, I'm allergic to them. Maybe, I don't know. I went through deliverance. Maybe I'm not even allergic to them, praise God, anymore. But nonetheless, I'm just, I'm not a cat guy, right? I, I'm not really a dog guy. But I, I'm a Thai guy, and she likes the dog, right? And so, yeah, I put up with the dog. But pay attention to how people treat their animals. I mean... If you can't be nice to something that barely even understands the words that's coming out of your mouth, how are you going to be nice to somebody that don't get it when they do understand the words coming out of your mouth? If you can't treat a dog right, if you can't treat a cat right, you know, and in the context where she's talking about horses, mules, things like that, things that they would use, you know what's interesting? Man, I'm just feeling it right now, praise God. You know what's interesting? I studied the Welsh revival, 1904 to 1906. Two million people swept into the kingdom of God. No English spoken, no English sung, all in Welsh. I named my son Evan Roberts after the great 24 and 25 and 26. During those three years, he was 24, 25, 26. And, and, I mean, this guy swept two million people into the kingdom of God. You know one of the greatest stories about the Welsh revival that's never told? The miners in the coal mines that got converted to Jesus. So here's what would happen. These miners would crawl deep into the earth with their mules, all of their baggage and their barrels of coal, didn't have all the modern conveniences that we have. And they would pull all that coal out of there. But you know what happened? The miners would go into the heart of the earth, get converted and under conviction in a cave. And they would walk out with all this black suit all over and there would be these huge tear track marks through their black coal faces. But you know what the phenomenon was that newspapers wrote about? When the miners got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, their mules stopped obeying them. They had to retrain their mules. You know why? Because the mules were not used 
to kindness. They were used to being beaten and kicked and cursed at. And when the men got saved, they changed their body language and their vocabulary. And the mules stared at them like mules. And didn't know what to do. Because a righteous man is even kind to his beast. Pay attention to the way people use their words. If people use their words with a forked tongue to hurt people, they are dangerous people. You know why they're dangerous? Because when they are in your presence, slithering that tongue out of their mouth, running someone else down behind their back, know that when you turn yours and they get in their presence, they will build them up and slither that tongue out of their throat and they will tear you down in their presence. And that's why Vance Havner, the late great preacher, said many years ago, God knew how evil your tongue was, so he keeps it in your throat behind iron bars called teeth so it don't jump out and bite somebody. It's a serpent. How do we give place to the devil? Using our tongue irresponsibly. Does that make sense? Now, I'm only going to read and categorize this verse because far too much needs to be said about verse 30 for me to go any further. I, I would pastorally do the text a magnificent injustice if I tried to preach on verse 30 in the next three or four minutes and just quit. No, no, no. This one verse is a standalone verse. It's a contextual verse that must be preached in its entirety, just the one verse. But after he said, kick the devil out, don't give place to him, he says, now here's what you do. Grieve not. That's a command. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now we may look at that and be like, okay, wait a minute, we're talking about God. Yep. Yeah. God the Holy Spirit. The first member of the Godhead we meet in the book of Genesis. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The first time you meet God, it's not the Father or Jesus. It's the Holy Ghost. So the church better stop disrespecting the Holy Spirit because he is God. But it's interesting that we think, you mean to tell me God gets offended? Uh, yep. God can be grieved? Yep. Can I remind you how the Holy Spirit displayed and illustrated himself at the baptism of Jesus? He did not come as an eagle. He came as a dove. A bird that you can easily <laughs> flutter away. And Paul says of the Holy Spirit, don't use your life visibly or your words verbally in a way that grieves God. It's dangerous. Churches all over this nation and around the world are filled with people and void of the presence of the Holy Spirit because we've grieved Him. We've grieved Him, and we must repent of that. So he says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye, you and I, are sealed unto the day of redemption. Don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. He lives within us. He protects us, saves us, seals us, examines us, provides for us, protects us. It's all of these things. We've had whole messages theologically on the power of the Holy Spirit. And while we don't preach more on it, I know not in the American landscape. But the Bible says these things that we're involved in, and I'm going to tell you next week what some of them still are, the bitterness, the wrath, the anger, all these things. He said these things grieve God. These things offend God. Now, we're not talking about cancel culture from God, and we're not talking about a culture in which everybody's offended. Okay, everybody's offended at everything these days. But you know what's interesting? Why is it in this buckwild culture, and I mean this from my heart as, as your friend and shepherd, why is it 
that we try so hard not to offend anyone except God. The church culture has been taught at all exhausting resources and elements. Don't offend people. But it's okay to offend God by not offending people. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So I say this, we pray we're done. I would not want to purposely grieve my friends in this room. I've done it. Don't want to inadvertently. I would never want to grieve my children. I've done it. Don't want to. That was a bad yeah. That was a bad yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Even wore your merch tonight. That was a bad yes. That was a bad yes. Hallelujah. Just kidding. I love you. But you know, even more so, you know where I'm going. I, I would never want to grieve my wife. Right? I wouldn't want to do something or speak to my wife in such a way that she shudders at my presence when I walk through the door. Or worse yet, shudders when I grab a microphone because she knows what I'm saying is a lie. You, you know why a lot of pastors' wives never go to church? Because their husbands are liars. And they're not going to sit on the front row and amen nonsense. Right? Am I telling it? <laughs> and so I would never want my wife to be grieved by my presence. So should I not a million times, a million times more be concerned with not wanting to grieve God? If I don't want my wife to be displeased with me, why am I okay with God being displeased with me? We shouldn't be. should bother us. should keep, it up, keep us up at night. Keep what the old timers call short accounts with God. When you sin, and we all do, deal with it. Don't linger for a week, linger for a month, don't linger for an hour. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, the old gospel song says. Get right immediately. If we confess our sins, the if there is conditional upon the fact that, yes, we're going to sin, and because of that, if we confess it, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you've grieved God, confess it, repent. God will cleanse you. I illustrate it like this. We're done. Years ago, I was in a town in Michigan. And I was doing an outdoor crusade, a revival meeting, a camp meeting is what they call it in my Baptist days. And usually if I am on the docket uh, in a conference, if I am offered the opportunity to go second or last, I normally take it. Because I found there's often times, not always, and I'm nothing special, but there's often times that the secondary preacher has to fix some of the theological problems that the first one made. And so this guy got up, and he was a basket case. Basket case. He never even preached the Bible. The only time he quoted it was when he said this, I'm sick of hearing people talk about 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins. He said, you know what that is? That ain't nothing but a crutch in a church world. Crutch, 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 crutch. If we, and he went on for 35 minutes to preach on the crutch of 1 John 1, 9. And I wasn't even in the spirit field days. But I was sitting there thinking, Holy Spirit, you've got to harness me. Because I'm about to hit him with a crutch. And he's up there just going after it. So I got up. And I said, I want you to turn to so-and-so. I, I, I was preaching somewhere in the Old Testament, Exodus or something. I said, just before I preach, I, I got to share something that the Lord has plainly laid upon my heart. I said, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but everything you just heard for the last 35 minutes has been utter nonsense. Oh, yeah, I think I won't put the shepherd's crook on somebody and pull them off a platform. Act a fool up in here. We'll turn your mic off. Matter of fact, if the wrong one preaches with it, we'll burn the sucker and get a brand new one. Praise God. Amen. That's what we did. <laughs> we don't play them games. So I said, everything you just heard is utter nonsense. I said, but I will say one thing and pay credence to what the guy said. I said, he got one thing right. I said, because uh, I want you to know that Jesus is not my crutch. 
I said, but I'll also let you know that Jesus is my wheelchair. I said, because I'm so broke down, I can't do anything without him. I said, so you just had a guy get up for 35 minutes and tell you that when you sin, you don't have a crutch. I said, but I'm here to tell you, when you sin, you got a wheelchair because God will pick you up and forgive you every single solid time, put you back on the solid rock, and he will put your sins as far as the east is from the west and remember them no more. So I'm glad when I'm busted, broke down, and living crazy, God says, I'll forgive you. So all of us have grieved the Lord at times in our life. Don't make it a habit. Don't live there. If you have, repent. Confess it. And you know what God will do? What church people should do. He'll get over it. God offers forgiveness. Don't you wish people did? Don't you wish people did? And so next week we'll pick up with grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. And then we'll go into the context of what it looks like. And how we actually go about grieving him. Father, thank you for the word of the Lord. Thank you for a hungry church in this room and online and all of our hubs and the leaders. Lord, what a, what a joy it was today to see not just the social media post, but to get a, a text message from, from Austin saying that just today in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina, we launched our 100th satellite hub at Global Vision. Wow. Thank you, Lord. These people are watching so faithfully around the world, just as faithful as we are in this room right now. So, Lord, thank you for giving us a host of people that just want to host your presence. Hungry people that just want to eat the meat and potatoes of the Word of God. So, bless every home, every husband, every wife, every hopeful, every child, every son and daughter in this room and around the world. And Lord, may we never live a life where we consistently and continually grieve you. May we gladden your heart. Lord, when we walk in a room, may we light up the room with encouragement and edification. Not pull other people down and not hang out with people that do. So give us, Lord, the gift of a right word in due season. Because it just takes one word to not just live somebody's day but to radically change somebody's life. Give us that grace, we pray, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Stand all over the room. I love you guys. Let's get around, hug each other, shake some hands. Don't run off too quick. We'll see you this weekend. And I know the Lord is going to do some amazing things in our midst. I love you guys. Thank you for being here.